Hi everyone, this is Patrick. I'm ready to record lesson three. Uh, you're not going to believe this. I've recorded this lesson three times and every time I forgot to turn on my microphone. Let me just take a look at it. Yes, my microphone is on. Okay. Alright. <laughs> Hopefully the third time will be the final time. So what I was uh, trying to go over today was divergence. Uh, I was thinking that, you know, talking about divergence would get us to talk about some more of the functions in the Metastock formula language. Um, there's many different definitions of a divergence. Um, and let's just review the two that I know of uh, before, before we get started. <coughs> so uh, here I just uh, created an indicator, uh, the RSI of the close over nine periods. Uh, so it's just RSI, open parenthesis, the data array you want to use comma the number of periods and I just click on OK and I'll click on close and I'll apply it on the chart oh it's already on the apply on the chart alright let's change this to a line <coughs> and let's uh, move it over in its own window alright there's uh, two ways to to do divergence or th there might be more but uh, the most I've seen uh, people either look for a divergence between the price and an indicator from a peak to a peak, so from this point to this point, for example, and then of course uh, using the matching values on the price. Or from the last peak to the most current price. So from the last peak right here to the most current price. Now we'll cover both uh, versions of the divergence. Now there's there's a lot of things that come into consideration. Uh, do you do a divergence from an indicator to another indicator? Do you do a divergence from the price of the indicator, do you uh, select your peak and trough on the price plot or from the indicator? I mean, there's many variations. I'm just going to do it the way I was taught on how to do it and the way I've seen it done. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's the absolute. Alright, so let me just edit this indicator quickly. Um, We'll create two variables. We'll create a variable called, you know what, let's do it indicator one, so IND one, and here we'll use a stochastic, that's T O C H, and then we'll use five, comma three. Alright, stochastic function. Open parenthesis, uh, what some people call the percent K and three is percent D. Uh, remember that matters is that first number. If you want a five period stochastic, or you know what, people use a 14 period stochastic usually, then just type in 14 there. Now let's do indicator 2 colon equal, and here I'm just going to type in close because I'll, I'll use the price uh, as my comparison. Uh, here I could type in, instead of close, I could type in, <coughs> I could type in MACD, I could type in RSI, I could even use a moving average of the price. Uh, just so that it's easier for you to see the code and for me to write it, I'll just use C. Much easier. Alright, so we, we've got our two indicators. <coughs> now, what we need to find out is when the last peak or the last trough was created. So, let's create a uh, variable called T1. We'll, we'll pick the trough value. So, uh, I'm going to type in trough. And then one saying I want the most occurrence of the trough of indicator one. And then I want a retracement of five percent. So I'll just type in five. So this is gonna plot the trough value. Let's let's take a look at it. If I type in T one here and I plot that on my screen, it's just pl uh, plotting a trough value. It's not really telling me when a new trough or when the last trough happened. So if I double click on this, 
and I create a, um, a new variable called uh, condition, so CD. My condition is I want the, the trot value to be different, different than its previous value. And that should give me uh, what I want. And as always, it's implied that this line here says if the value of trot1 is different than the reference of trot1, comma, minus 1, plot a 1, if not, plot a 0. Just click on OK here. And you can see here that uh, the indicator plotted a 1 here and there. Let's uh, just, just to take a look at what it found, let's just plot a stochastic quickly here. So we'll do a stochastic oscillator. Let's put it on. Yeah, let's put it on top. Why not? And then we said 14.3, right? And then we'll do merge with scale and right. All right. So it's using. It's using those as trough. You see, this one is good. This one's pretty good. This one's pretty good. This one's pretty good. This one is good, I guess. And this one is good, I guess. The problem is. I would rather not see those kind of things. So what I can do is I can change that 5% retracement into a 10% retracement. Then click on apply and see if maybe I get rid of one of them. Nope. Why not try something like 25? <coughs> hmm. That didn't get rid of what I wanted. There's uh, many, many different versions. Actually, I shouldn't say there's many different versions. People um, have their own definition of what a trough is. A lot of people uh, do not use the trough function in Metastock. Uh, and I guess you could replace the trough function in the indicator we're working on by your own version of the trough indicator. That's what I'm trying to say. Alright, so, but that, that looks pretty good. That shows me a 1 every time the trough, uh, there's a trough on the chart. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to find out the value of my indicator and the value of the price at the time of the last drop, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to type in value of the indicator 1 and I'm going to use the value when function. Value when function is kind of like the trough function. I type in the value when, open parenthesis, 1 for the most recent occurrence and here I'm supposed to type in the condition. So I could be, you know, C greater than X, whatever. Right now my condition is that I have a new trough, CD. I could type in, when I type in CD like that, it's as if I was typing CD equal 1. Uh, the program assumes that I'm saying CD equals 1. CD is true. When condition is true, then do something. So I don't need to type in CD equal 1. So value when, open parenthesis 1, comma, condition, comma and then the value I want back so first value I want back is my first indicator alright now I need to do the same thing for the price so I can actually just copy the formula press control V and I'll just change it to uh, value indicator 2 and then I'll just type in indicator 2 right there now if we do it the easy ver the easy way. We want to compare the most current value of an indicator to its previous value at the trough to the most current value of the price to the price value at the time of the trough. I just and let's say we're looking for uh, um, the indicator going up while the price is going down. I'm going to say indicator 1 which is going to return the most current value of the indicator greater than the value of the indicator 1 and um, indicator 2. So here I want the most current value of the price to be less than the value at the time of the trough. So value of the indicator 2. Now I'm going to click on apply and I'm going to click on OK. Alright, so that, that gives me a couple of signals. Uh, not so much worried about whether the signals are good or not here. But if you look at this quickly, you can see you actually have some signals. It actually happens every once in a while. One of the, the biggest grief I had when I was uh, writing formulas for customers is that I would write divergence formulas and send them back 
and the person trying it was disappointed or didn't think it worked because there were no results. They would run explorations, nothing came up. Problem is when you write it the other way, when you go from the most recent two picks or the most recent two troughs, you rarely have signals. And I mean, I insist on the word rarely. It's rare. Maybe once a month you'll find something. So just so you know, before, I mean, if you're somebody that, you know, likes to have a lot of securities to work with, before you get started in divergence and that kind of thing, just know that it's going to be very select few securities, at least with the, the formulas I've done in the past and the formulas I've seen. Um, so let's convert that quickly. Why why can't we just use value when 2 to recreate the most recent 2 and not use the last price, right? So let's d delete this. And let's just change the names a little bit so that we, we don't get confused. Let's do uh, V1 and V2. And then actually, let's call this T1. All right. And then let's copy this. Control C. Let's call it V2. So V is going to represent the indicator and T is going to represent the price. Actually, I should change this to P. Alright, so P1 and then I'll do P2. And you know what? To make it even more clever, let's do I1 for indicator 1 and I2 for indicator 2. Alright, and then P1 for price 1 and P2 for price 2. Alright, so I1 is the most recent value of the indicator. Value 1, 1, C, the indicator 1. Sounds good. I2 is the second most recent value of the indicator. So here I'm just changing the value in. Okay? Indicator 1 sounds good. Price 1, value in 1, the most recent one. And the I1, the one before that. Then I just change my condition to I1 greater than I2 and P1 less than P2. Then click on apply. Now let's close this. Let's zoom out of the chart. And oh, I actually get signals. Cool. All right. Um, I guess the divergence on the stochastic has more results. I've done some tests in the previous lessons I've recorded where it just wouldn't show up anything. All right. So here's our signals. So let's take a look at our formula again. And uh, let's go over a few steps. So the first thing we did is we declared our two indicators that we want to use for the divergence. The next thing we did is we defined what you know we were looking for. So here, if I was looking for the peak, I would just have to change this here to peak. That's it. That's all I have to do to the opposite. Here I was looking for when a new peak or trough occurred. And then here I just calculated the values I needed to find my divergence and then I just typed in my condition right there so uh, it wasn't that bad um, before I conclude this lesson let, let's take a look at uh, Joseph Silva divergence formula since somebody asked about it on the, the form uh, Joseph Silva's uh, website is metastocktools.com I believe alright so let's go to metastock Okay, then I'm going to click on uh, Metastock Indicators. Um, he has a lot of indicators and they're usually very well written. Uh, he actually has the patience to write comments out. So I would recommend you, you take a look at some of his work, especially since it's free. Or at least most of it. Um, let's go down. What am I looking for? Divergence version 3, I'm guessing. Alright. So here. Here's the beginning of the formula. So here's his little notes and comments. And then here's where it really starts. So first thing is the user inputs. It's got a variable. 
uh, int for indicator I'm guessing then you created an input function that asks you to type in a number between 1 and 5 and if you type in 1 then he's going to return the value of the MACD if you type in 2 he's going to return a stochastic if you type in 3 the RSI and so on and so on uh, then he's got another variable called periods here where he asks you to input the uh, periods you want to use for the indicator and then F is the price array or the price field input you type in 1 he's going to use the close for its calculation you type in 2 it's going to use the high and the low CH is kind of his own uh, percent retracement input remember in the trough function in my indicator I said oh let's use 5 or 10 or 20% retracement to find a peak and trough. CH here is that percent retracement. So he offers you the choice of uh, entering a value for your retracement as soon as you apply the indicator, which is pretty cool. Uh, shift input shift signals back to match divergence. One, zero, one. I'm not sure what that does. I'm just going to skip it for now. All right, so after he created all his input, um, he's gonna uh, select which indicator to use. So remember, he's gonna use your int input at the beginning to find out what indicator you wanted. So he's gonna do if the indicator equal one, then calculate the MACD or return the MACD. If your indicator input was two, then calculate the stochastic using the periods that was used in the input. If three, the RSI, same thing so forth and so on. So after Y has been computed, uh, you've got an indicator. You know which indicator should be used to calculate the divergence. Then here, the third part is he calculates his custom um, price, peaks, and trough. Apparently, he does both of them. He does the peaks and the trough in the same shot. And then here he calculates his own indicator peaks and trough. And then finally the last line here, he does the condition. Um, what you should really look at is the way his inputs were created because this is really useful. I unfortunately don't spend the time to do those kind of things and this is a great example on how you can customize your indicator so that you can quickly adjust it and change it to do something else. Alright, I think that's it for today. If you've got any questions, please uh, do not hesitate to post them in the forum. I'll try to